Okay, I am really impressed you guys made it in today. I did not expect that many of you to be here because of the roads. Um, because of the roads and how slippery it is, I'm actually going to record this lecture. So I'm going to stand over here. I don't usually stand over here. I'm going to stand over here. Um, class business, final exam, is next Monday. Uh, there have been some questions that I've been posting to the forum on Blackboard. So if you have questions, last minute questions, you'll find the answers to some of them on uh, Blackboard. Um, I will not be covering anatomy. This is not an anatomy class. But there will be um, some questions like, your patient has a disease of the upper respiratory system, blah, blah, blah. So it would help to know what the upper, upper respiratory system is. But I'm not going to quiz you on specific parts of anatomy. I'm not going to ask you to explain the difference between the jejunum and the ilium. Um, exam three, there were two contested questions. Um, I will assess them today and change grades by Wednesday. I haven't uh, looked at them to make sure that they are things that, um, that I'm going to accept the answers. So I'll take a look at them today. OK, for those of you who will be taking classes in the spring, I'll be teaching microbial genetics. This is an upper level class. It counts towards your, um, it counts towards your upper division credits in both the BA and the BS of biological and natural sciences programs. It will be offered Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. Uh, there's also um, micro-EL, uh, microbial ecology. For those of you who are interested in microbes in the environment, Dr. Briggs and Dr. Chris Duddleson will be teaching that. Um, both classes have 340, bio 340 listed. I am accepting uh, 240 students for my microgenetics. And if you're interested in asking Dr. Briggs or Dr. Duddleson if you can get into that mi microecology EL, uh, shoot them an email. Okay, I have a question for you. A very timely one. Your classmate comes to lab with a cough, a runny nose, extremely tired, and a high fever. She insists that she just has a cold. Which of these symptoms tells you it's the flu, not a cold? The cough and runny nose, the runny nose and fatigue, fatigue and fever, none. She clearly just has a cold. Okay, once again, classmate comes to lab with a cough, a runny nose, extremely tired, and a high fever. And so she just has a cold. Which of these symptoms tells you it's the flu, not a cold? All right, I'm going to do the countdown. All right, got those answers in? The fatigue and fever, very good. A uh, high fever is associated with the flu, not typically with the cold. There's not usually a high fever with the cold. That extreme fatigue, like I can't even describe the fatigue to those of you who've not had the flu. It's extreme. It's not like a cold where you get a little bit tired. The flu, you get extremely tired, like you can't move out of bed. All right, one more question, review from today's reading. Which of these is, um, which of these is, Important pieces, oh, good writing, um, of information is important. <sighs> Which of these pieces of information is, is important, that's what I'm supposed to say, for determining the cause of a diarrheal infection? Where the patient has traveled, what food the patient has eaten, where the patient, uh, whether the patient is immunocompromised, what the diarrhea looks like, or all of the above are important. Again, which of these pieces of information is important for determining the cause of a diarrheal infection? Yes, All right, starting the countdown. Oh, we have another person who joined us. All right, let's see what it is. Nobody answered. Oh, there we go. Yes, all of the above are important. 
It's going to be very important to know whether the patient has traveled um, in different areas of the country, what food the patient has eaten can clearly tell you whether or not they've gotten food poisoning, whether the patient is immunocompromised, some of these diseases will affect immunocompromised more than healthy, what the diarrhea looks like, we're going to talk about the difference between bloody diarrhea and frothy diarrhea, so another one of those information overload classes, so all of the above are important. Okay, but first we're going to finish mycoses. Did I cover this last lecture? I started to and I didn't. Okay, thank you. I could not remember. Um, okay, mycoses. These are going to be fungal infections of the upper respiratory system. So we're, we're finishing off the upper respiratory system before we get into the digestive system. This is another case where it's really important to know where a patient has been traveling because there are different mycoses associated, or fungal <laughs> infections, associated with different parts of the world. So, for example, oh, you can't see this. Nice. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, coccidiomycosis is more associated with the southern part, the southwestern part of the United States in various parts of South America, whereas blastomycosis is found mostly through uh, the middle uh, and um, the eastern part of the United States, and histoplasmosis um, is more commonly found in specific regions of Africa, South America, and the United States. So finding out where the patient has traveled to or has been for the last few weeks is going to be really important in determining what type of fungal infection that they might have in their respiratory system. We're going to focus on histoplasmosis for this class, so we're not going to focus on coccidi coccidiomycosis <coughs> or um, blastomycosis. We're going to focus on histoplasmosis. And part of the reason for that is because that's one of the biggest ones here in the United States. There are areas that are endemic for histoplasmosis all over the United States, and you can see here, though, that there are highly endemic regions and some that are slightly less endemic. Um, they don't show Alaska on here. We don't have a ton of histoplasmosis, but we do have some cases. It's most commonly found in the environment, um, and it's quite tightly associated with the feces of animals. So, for example, here we're showing some uh, bat, uh, bats in an attic. We do have bats here in Alaska. They're showing bats in an attic that have dropped some feces, and this feces has histopla um, histoplasma um, histoplasm capsulatum in the feces. People get infected when they inhale the spores from these microbes. This gets into the lungs. In the lungs, they change from this yeast form into a hyphal form. So they come in as this budding yeast form, but then they change into this hyphal form. They can also then spread into the lymph nodes. So here we're showing these yeast forms in the lymph um, Oh, I'm sorry, they, they transform into a budding yeast. Oh, my bad. They transform from a spore into a budding yeast. I'm thinking of a different disease. This is what happens when you know too many fungal infections. Okay, so this yeast form, this budding yeast form, um, uh, emerges when the um, spores get into a nice warm lung. The lungs are nice, they're about 37 degrees Celsius, which is the inside body of your temperature. They transform into this yeast form, and then they can spread through the lymph and through the blood. These, this, portion, this portion here is extremely uh, dangerous because as they spread through the blood, this then becomes a systemic infection, and you can have complications in other parts of the body. This is commonly found in immunocompromised patients. If you have a healthy immune system, your body is able to clear this infection. But in immunocompromised patients, this is going to become a serious infection. This is what the lungs of somebody who has histoplasmosis looks like. You can see that it's just riddled with little white buds. These are calcified nodes. These little calcified nodes um, are found all over the lungs. So remember when we talked about pneumonia and pneumonia and oh, I cannot talk today. When we talked about the infections of the lungs last week, we talked about some that were found in one node of the lung versus both nodes. Um, most of them were found in the lower part of the respiratory system, or lower part of the lungs. This is scattered throughout the entire lung. 
And these, the reason that you can see it on the x-ray is because these are calcified nodules. This is a healed patient. This healed patient is asymptomatic, but you can see that if something were to occur to make this, um, uh, to infect the lung again, that this patient may have a harder time with that second infection. This is what the yeast look like in macrophages, so they are able to replicate inside macrophages, and that's one way that they're able to spread throughout the body. Disseminated histoplasmosis in an AIDS patient, so somebody who's severely immunocompromised, looks like this, where you have a very bumpy rash um, at, throughout the body. This is on the back, here's their arm. But this is a patient who is immunocompromised, but they have a rash all over their body. Most patients will recover quickly, but again, the immunocompromised will not. Um, this is, I like talking about this. You don't have to know this for the exam, because I know you're on information overload. Histoplasma is uh, actually the, or histoplasmosis is actually the origin for the mummy's curse. So when you come in contact with high concentrations of yeast, if, or um, of uh, these spores, even if you're healthy, then you will, be, you will have a, um, develop a, young, a lung infection. Now, most often you're going to come in contact with really high concentrations of these spores. If you're in some place like a cave, or in this case, uh, for the mummy's tomb, um, inside a place where a lot of bats would conjugate, in, in this particular case, it's a tomb. Man, I cannot talk well when I'm not pacing. I'd never noticed this before. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so in this particular case, when you have somebody who's very healthy, but they come in contact with an awful lot of spores, then they inhale the spores, this high concentration of spores leads to an infection in the lungs, they become extremely fatigued, they can't breathe as well because their lungs are clogged up with these budding yeasts that are start starting to spread, and they get very sick very quickly. Well, that is where the curse of the mummy's tomb actually comes from, for those of you who watch those really fun movies uh, back in the 50s. Okay, you don't have to memorize that for your exam. I just thought it was an interesting side note because I think histoplasmosis is just fascinating in and of itself. Here are the, um, the details on histoplasmosis uh, that uh, a lot of these I've already talked about. Signs and symptoms are a dry, unproductive cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, fever, chills, headache, and malaise. So a lot of those sound like basic pneumonias. Sounds a little bit like tuberculosis, uh, but if it's somebody who's immunocompromised, who's come in contact with feces from uh, animals, then one of the things you're going to want to look for is histoplasmosis. Diagnosis, let's see here, where's diagnosis? Diagnosis is uh, looking for these um, uh, yeast in the uh, lungs. Let's see, where does it say that? Oh, awesome. I don't think it says it up here. Treatment is um, antifungal. Uh, medication, including this amphiparacin B that we talked about quite a bit. Prevention is to minimize exposure to soil, especially in your chicken coops or bat caves. And if you are going to go into those areas and you're immunocompromised or you're younger than 15 years old, then wear a mask. <coughs> okay, so that's my coastlies. Now we're going to move on to microbial diseases of the digestive system. Chapter 23. We're going to start out with an overview of the digestive system, talk about dental diseases first. We're going to cover mumps today and peptic ulcers, gastroenteritis, let's see if I spelled it right that time, hepatitis, and we're going to finish off with parasitic diseases. It's a little out of order than the way they present it in the book, um, just because I have a difference of the way I think it should be presented. Okay, so the digestive system really is basically, you can think of it as we take in food, we have to break it up to uh, get those nutrients from the food, those have to be disseminated through our body somehow, and then we eliminate them. So we take in things through the mouth. The mouth has uh, salivary glands that provide um, enzymes and other things to break up our food, and of course we have our mechanical action from the, uh, from the teeth gnashing and the tongue moving food around. Um, food then goes down the esophagus, Food then goes down the esophagus. Um, all of the digestive tract is uh, lined with mucosal cells secreting mucus to help move things down. Of course, this esophagus is yet another tube. It has a nice lining of mucosa that allows, tube to, uh, allows food to go from the mouth into the stomach um, very quickly. 
In the stomach, we have pancreatic, uh, I'm sorry, in the stomach, we have a low acidity um, uh, driven in part by this hydrochloric acid and pepsin that helps break down food further and prevents uh, infection from a lot of different microbes because most microbes cannot survive that low acidity. We'll talk about one today that can. The food then moves into the intestine. In the small intestine, food is absorbed by villi and microvilli. In the large intestine, um, uh, more nutrients are absorbed, this is the large intestine, more nutrients are absorbed and water is absorbed. There are some accessory items, uh, organs to the digestive system, including the liver, that nice big organ over here. The liver produces bile and breaks down and excretes or stores toxins and bilirubin. This bilirubin is important to the hepatitis that we're going to talk about later when uh, the liver is not able to take care of this bilirubin. It circulates in our blood and gives us that yellow fringe. The gallbladder stores bile, uh, which uh, helps break down nutrients. The pancreas <coughs> makes digestive enzymes, and those digestive enzymes from the pancreas get emptied into um, the lower, port, uh, lower part of the stomach and the large intestine. The gut has a lot of structure to it. Well, I'm not going to make you memorize this. But what I did want to point out here are these villi. So the gut is basically, we used to think of it just as a long tube. Now we can think of it as a bumpy tube. And the bumpy tube are all these villi. These villi are finger-like intrusions that go into the lumen of the gut. The lumen is inside of that tube. And it's highly vascularized. So you can see blood here, uh, the red uh, oxygenated blood and the blue um, uh, 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 veins, and these are throughout the entire intestine. This is important when we're thinking about diseases. These uh, blood capillaries do a couple of things. One is that they bring immune cells. Uh, two, um, they absorb nutrients from these villi that are um, lining the inside of the uh, gut. Uh, nutrients cross this uh, barrier and come into uh, the blood where they can get distributed throughout the body. This also, when thinking about pathogens, is a great way for pathogens to go uh, spread throughout the body. So we're going to talk today about some pathogens that are able to cause bloody diarrhea. In part, that's because they're able to break through this epithelial layer and get to this nice capillary system underneath those villi. We have a number of intestinal barriers that prevent pathogens from colonizing. One is our microbiota, which I study, and I love studying microbiota. Um, these microbiota include bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and importantly, viruses. Your book leaves out the viruses. We know that there's a very rich virome in the gut. And the very top there, we have the commensal bacteria. These commensal bacteria uh, compete with pathogens for nutrients and also docking places. They also stimulate the immune system. Most of these bacteria are uh, bacteroides or enterobacteriaceae. Um, there are uh, gram positives in there as well, like lactobacillus. Let's see. We talked about IgA in the past being part of that um, mucosal layer. Ig secreted IgA is found within the mucosal layer of the gut. There is mucosa uh, uh, along the entire intestine. And what was else? Oh, and then there are immune cells just underneath the um, in, uh, epithelial layer of the gut ready and primed to fight off infections. So our intestinal system actually has a pretty good barrier against infections. We're, we're going to see that every once in a while that can get disturbed. OK, we're going to start off on top with diseases of the mouth. Some of you are going to go into dental school. All of you have teeth, so this should be important to you. One of the things I wanted to point out about the teeth and uh, socket structures, there is a nice, healthy microbiota in the mouth. We're showing here some microbes up on top, but there are also microbes here you can see next to the gum. These microbes are different on the top than they are from inside here. These tend to be a little more anaerobic. That becomes important when we consume foods that are high in nutrients for those anaerobic microbes. But before we get to that and dental uh, destruction of the teeth, I wanted to talk about the difference between the enamel and the pulp. So the enamel is actually the hardest structure in the body. It's even harder than bones. So it's harder for, um, uh, it's pretty hard to actually break this down. 
But any of you who have cavities know that that can get broken down. And when that gets broken down, then the pulp can become infected, the dentin in the pulp. These are much easier to, um, these are not nearly as hard. And so if a whole, if a microbe or a group of microbes is able to break through this enamel, once they get to the pulp and the dentin, then uh, this spreads pretty quickly. Under here, we have a nice, um, uh, a whole bunch of nerve cells and capillary cells. This is part of the reason that when we get a tooth infection, it can be pretty bloody and pretty painful. And then, of course, uh, the gums are also uh, also have a nice blood flow to them. And here we have the bones underneath the, the teeth. So what happens during uh, dental caries and gingivitis? So dental caries is basically cavities. In this particular case, you have a microbe that's part of the normal microbiota. This is important. So most of the diarrheal infections that we're going to talk about are microbes that come from the outside. This is part of the normal microbiota, Streptococcus mucans. Um, strep mucans is not the only microbe that can cause ca uh, cavities and gingivitis, but it's one of the most common. Dextran is a nice sugar source. Um, I'm sorry, dextran is a uh, sugar that this microbe uh, can take nutrients and convert those nutrients into dextran and pili. That allows biofilm to form on the surface of the tooth. So here we have our nice little biofilm being formed by streptococcus. Dextran and pili are allowing this biofilm formation to, um, uh, 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 to come in to, uh, to form. And that turns into plaque when you get enough of that biofilm forming. Acid from fermentation of food destroys the enamel. That's important. This isn't a toxin that's being produced that destroys the enamel. It's acid from fermentation. So remember that cell chemistry that we talked about um, for an entire lecture. Uh, that's one of the reasons we talked about it. The treatment is basically to fill in the cavities. But if this particular infection, this, this, um, uh, these microbes building up, building a nice biofilm, forming some plaques, is able to continue then you can get some further destruction of the tooth. So here we have that biofilm that's formed, and now there's a hole where that biofilm had, for, had, had started forming. And again, this hole is due to acid breaking down the enamel. Once those holes get big enough, it starts breaking into these layers underneath the enamel uh, and eventually come in contact with these nerves. That's what causes the pain. And then eventually you get some nice spreading of this infection from one tooth to, um, uh, uh, you get nice destruction of the tooth all the way into those nerve endings in the blood. So what does that look like? Here we have tartar, that's that plaque buildup. That, um, so now when you look at your teeth and you notice all that beautiful tartar in there, just remember that that's made by microbes in your mouth. Uh, gingivitis is the inflammation of the gums that you can see here. They're swollen, they're inflamed, they're red, uh, they're much more easy to, to bleed, they're often very tender. So this is an example of periodontal disease. It's most often caused by um, Prophiomonas gingivalis or Streptococcus mutans. And again, Streptococcus mutans is a member of the normal microbiota. Proteases created by these microbes are able to break down this gingival tissue, uh, this, this, these gum, this gum tissue. This gingival tissue can't be remade by the uh, body, so if this goes on long enough, you can get something called trench mouth or acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. This is an extreme form of gingivitis. You can see that the gums are basically destroyed, resulting in, um, the, you can now see the roots of these teeth. And uh, this is, again, due to these microbes that started off as a little biofilm and were allowed to grow. Treatment is scaling and antimicrobial or antibacterial rinses. Eventually, if this gets bad enough, you can do a gum replacement, but that's extremely painful and doesn't always work from what I hear. Okay, so here's the nice summary. I'm not gonna go through all the summaries today because we have a lot to cover. Uh, prevention, avoid foods containing sugar. <laughs> really easy around Christmas, a holidays. Um, regular toothbrushing is important to disrupt those microbial communities and prevent that biofilm and plaque from forming, and then fluoridation to kill the microbes. Okay. 
So there is more than one type of disease of the mouth. The other one is mumps. This is a disease of the salivary, salivary glands. This is an important topic. I was going to skip it this year, but then we had a huge mumps outbreak here in Anchorage um, where we've had over 70 people infected. Um, it's caused by a virus. You can see the virus down here. This is, um, we have an outbreak here in Alaska. There have been outbreaks all over the United States. These are the cases as of uh, November 4th. This hasn't been updated in the last month. So um, you can see there are some states that have more than 300 cases of mumps um, current or this past year. This is all from this year. And here in Alaska, um, uh, this is now up to 70. So we would actually be in the darker pink here. Mumps was pretty much eradicated from the United States, but it's made a resurgence. So here you can see it into 2004. We had very few cases of mumps. Um, there was a spike in 2006. It basically went away for a little bit. And now here we're having uh, thousands of cases of mumps in the United States um, every year, in large part for two reasons. One, because fewer people are becoming vaccinated. Two, because the current vaccination doesn't lead to a hundred un 100% coverage, 100% um, effectiveness. So it's important that if you are in an area such as Anchorage that's going through a current outbreak, that you get an updated mumps vaccine to prevent um, uh, to prevent uh, mumps from spreading in your family. Mumps enters through the the, the virus that causes mumps uh, is rube rubella virus here. Um, this enters through the respiratory tract, multiplies, and then invades the blood and then disseminates. If it stays within the, within the, the head area, you get inflammation of the salivary glands. And I'm showing you here in this bottom picture um, the salivary glands of the mouth. And so that inflammation comes from those glands um, becoming inflamed. And here you can see this patient has a parathroid uh, salivary gland that's inflamed. The signs and, signs and symptoms include that swelling. You can also have face pain, fever, headache, and sore throat. If this does become um, uh, disseminated, then you can get things such as inflammation of the testes, meninges, pancreatitis, and deafness. Uh, those all occur in fewer than 1% of the population that get, gets mumps. But if you have 6,000 cases, then 1% is 60 people. Two doses of the vaccine is 88% effective. They are now suggesting that people in outbreak states like uh, Anchorage get a third dose as an adult. Um, I just threw this in here. You don't have to read this uh, right now. You can look at it later. This is a nice summary from the CDC that explains um, why vaccines, some vaccines do really well at preventing diseases and others don't do quite as well. But even for the vaccinations, that don't have 100% coverage like mumps, um, it's still important to get vaccinated. But we're not going to go over it right now. Okay, that's mumps. Any questions so far? Okay. We're going to move on to peptic ulcer disease. So in the corner there, I'm trying to highlight the different areas of the body that we're talking about. Now we're going to move on to diseases of the stomach, and we're only going to cover Helicobacter pylori. This is a um, fun little spirochete. So in the top there, you can see the spirochete. It has a flagella, which isn't quite as easy to make out there, but you can see occasionally there's this little line that these are the flagella from, the, um, from Helicobacter. That is one of the virulence factors. The fact that this microbe can swim around in gastric juices enables it to find the edge of the stomach and infect the, the lining of the stomach. It also has adhesins. So we see here we have some nice flagella that have a, a flagellated helicobacter pylori that have swum around in the stomach until they found the edge of the stomach. They are then able to attach to the epithelial cells. They get through that mucus. The uh, flagella are important for swimming through the mucus. They attach to the epithelial <coughs> cells, so adhesins are another virulence factor. And then as they're swimming around, they're able to uh, make a protein, you don't have to memorize which one, that inhibits acid production by stomach cells. So that helps them survive um, in this acidic, normally acidic environment. They actually prevent the stomach from making more acid. 
They also have enzymes that inhibit phagocytic killing, which enables them to get through uh, to um, uh, be able to survive in that mucus layer next to the epithelial cells. And then they produce urease once they come in contact with um, these epithelial cells. They produce urease that neutralizes the stomach acid around them, again, enabling them to live in this area that would area of the body that would normally be uh, very acidic. Once they're able to attach, they um, produce uh, toxins and um, cause inflammation in that layer, and they start thinning out that mucosal layer. And that's important because once that mucosal layer becomes really thin, then the acid from the stomach is able to come in contact with the epithelial cells and destroy the epithelial cells. And this is where you get ulcers building. In part, it's from the toxins that the bacteria make, but it's also because the bacteria are thinning out that mucosal layer that usually protects the intestinal, or sorry, the stomach cells. And once that mucosal layer is gone, then gastric, um, the acidic gastric juice is able to come in contact with these cells and destroy them, and you get uh, destruction of the tissues all the way down to the blood system. So these ulcers are holes in the um, epithelial li lining. They're often um, bloody because they're uh, able to get the, able to destroy tissues all the way down to that blood system. There are a couple of different ways to get Helicobacter pylori. One is just living with somebody who has a Helicobacter pylori infection. There's a really great argument for actually having Helicobacter um, when you're younger that, um, Marty Blazer, Dr. Martin Blazer, uh, has uh, pioneered. Um, if you want to hear more about that, come and talk to me because I love talking about it. But for this particular class, we're just going to talk about the fact that you can get it by living in crowded conditions with no reliable source of clean water with somebody else who has Helicobacter. This is basically the fecal oral route. We're going to talk a lot today about the fecal oral route. And remember from uh, one of my previous classes, I think I said that the fecal oral route doesn't necessarily mean that you're ingesting uh, feces. It means that somebody uses the bathroom and then prepares your food or uh, touches something that you touch. It's not necessarily that you're, um, yeah, I, I won't get that graphic. Anyway, um, this can uh, uh, be prevented by washing hands, um, having running water that washes away uh, fecal material, etc. Another way to get it is to drink a liquid culture of it. That particular person is Dr. Marshall, who wanted to prove that Helicobacter causes ulcers, and so he drank a culture of it because nobody would believe him that that was the cause of ulcer. I don't recommend that ever. Don't drink your liquid cultures. But one of the reasons he was so adamant about proving that this is caused by a microbe was because um, ulcers can lead to cancer. So in patients who have Helicobacter pylori, 80% are either asymptomatic or they have gastritis, so they just have inflammation of the stomach, and they may have abdom abdominal pain associated with that. 15 to 20% are going to develop some nice ulcers. Um, so here's a nice gastric ulcer. There's that, that destruction of the stomach lining. But in 1% of the cases, um, patients will develop gastric cancer. This is actually a big problem here in Alaska. Uh, Alaska natives in particular have an increased rate of ulcer, uh, gastric cancer compared to other people in Alaska. Dr. Holly Martinson on campus is studying um, whether or not Helicobacter pylori causes gastric, the increased uh, cases of gastric cancer in Alaska natives and whether we're more susceptible uh, due to our um, body's way of destroying this particular microbe. <clears throat> Treatment for this particular infection is um, amoxicillin and clarithromycin given in conjunction with acid blocking drugs for one or two weeks. There's a really nice paper that came out a couple of months ago showing that the proton inhibitors that's used to kill helicobacter also disrupts the microbiota and can lead to other um, problems. So this Treatment um, includes proton inhibitors, but that may change soon. Prevention is good personal hygiene, adequate sanitation, proper food handling, 
um, making sure you wash your hands, lifestyle changes to reduce risk, including dietary changes to reduce stomach acid imbalances, etc. Okay, I have a question for you. Which of these is a virulence factor of Helicobacter pylori? Is it shigatoxin, capsid, hemi, or flagella? Okay, I'm going to give you the countdown. All right, what do you think? The quick review. We haven't talked about shigatoxin yet. We're going to talk about it in just a minute. Um, hemi, which type of microbe is going to have hemi? Bacteria, viruses, archaea, um, fungi, protozoa. Which ones are going to have hemi or hemi? Hmm? Protozoa is a good guess. It's not, not the one I'm looking for. Archaea. Archaea are going to have hemi. Yep. Flagella are most often to be found in bacteria. Some eukaryotes have them. We're going to talk about shigatoxin in just a minute. And capsid. What type of microbe has a capsid? Virus, protozoa, viruses. I pause after viruses. I'm like uh, trying to come up with something else. See this pacing thing, man. I need pacing. Okay, so now we're going to move to gastroenteritis. This is going to be inflammation. That's where the itis comes from. Gastro refers to the stomach area, entero refers to the, oh, yeah, entero refers to the gut. So this is going to be inflammation of the stomach and the gut. Gastroenteritis is a huge problem worldwide. So one of my favorite websites to go to to find out about more about infections is ProMed Mail. I've talked about it once or twice before. I did a quick search for diarrhea. For, from just the past year, December of last year to December of this year, there were over 474 articles about diarrheal outbreaks um, in the world. And this is a nice collection of them. Some of them are associated with um, uh, developing countries. Others uh, are foodborne illnesses or are an awful lot of foodborne illnesses. Um, it affects people of all social classes. Um, let's see if I included it in this one. One of the searches I did showed that it was uh, there was a diarrheal infection associated with caviar. So this is affecting everybody of every social class around the world. Um, we don't have a pin in Alaska, but I know we've had diarrhea outbreaks here in Alaska as well. I also wanted to show that it's caused by a number of different uh, bacteria and um, eukaryotes. So for example, here's toxic algae that can cause diarrhea. Um, and some nice viruses like, uh, let's see, where's the virus? Oh, I don't have the virus on. Oh, uh, Ebola, one of the Ebola. Um, we're not going to talk about Ebola in this particular class, but it can also cause diarrhea. So it causes, there are a number of different types of microbes that can cause di diarrhea. The um, symptoms that are associated with gastroenteritis, Nausea, vomiting, this is all affecting both the stomach and the gut. You're going to have nausea because your body is trying to reject the microbes and possibly toxins that it's producing, so you get nausea and vomiting. Diarrhea, we're going to talk about why that occurs. Abdominal pain from your body, again, cramping up and trying to get rid of these microbes. Dysentery is going to produce loose, frequent stool containing mucus and blood. I thought this was a nice picture of somebody with gastroenteritis. This is much more representative of what somebody with gastroenteritis looks like. You feel really horrible. Um, this is inflammation of the stomach or the intestines, and it's often associated with contaminated food or water or poor living conditions. In the book, they start out with bacterial infections, but I'm going to start out with viral infections. And I'm only going to talk briefly about these. There are a number of different viruses that can cause gastroenteritis, including rotavirus, norovirus, adenovirus, and astrovirus. You can see that they're all slightly different. Um, they affect, uh, they tend, 
um, uh, death from rotavirus in particular uh, is most common in developing countries. So here I'm showing um, developing countries in the continent of Africa uh, have higher cases of death by rotavirus, although you can have infections uh, by rotavirus here in the United States as well, obviously, because we have outbreaks in schools all the time. These are self-limiting diseases. The, um, they typically, the symptoms appear typically within 12 to 20, 24 hours of infection, and, but they resolve within 60 hours. So these are short-lived diarrheal infections. These are caused by lytic viruses. These are all lytic. They are not latent, so you're not going to have a recurring infection. You tend to have a single infection uh, that occurs, and then it's cleared. It infects epithelial cells lining the intestine. Treatment is based on fluid and electrolyte replacement. So you're not treated with antivirals. You're just given fluids to replace all that liquid that you're losing um, through diarrhea. Prevention involves proper treatment of water and sewage and good hygiene practices. Again, wash your hands. And there is a vaccine for rotavirus, which is one of the reasons that it's not quite as deadly here in the United States or in developing countries, because we actually have a virus against, uh, a vaccine against it. That's it. That's all I'm going to cover for viral diseases, viral gastroenteritis. And in part, it's because this is self-limiting and these... Um, uh, these infections go away within a short period of time. I do have a question for you, though. Gastroenteritis is typically caused by latent viruses. True or false? Okay, let me give you the countdown. All right, what do you think? Latent viruses? False. false. It's false. Um, these are typically caused by lytic viruses. In the latent virus, um, why do the cells, why does the infection go away and come back after a while? Where, what's happening? What's that? Could be a secondary infection, but in a latent virus specifically, what, what, what's happening in a latent virus? Why do you not have symptoms for a while? <coughs> what's happening with the DNA of the virus? What's that? Exactly. The DNA in a latent virus incorporates into your own genome, hides away for a little while, doesn't replicate, doesn't lyse your cells, once it becomes activated and starts slicing your cells again, then you get infections again. These gastroenteritis, though, are caused by lytic viruses, so they're going to get into your cells, replicate, lyse your cell, and then cause infection, uh, cause symptoms related to that. Okay. Now we're going to move on to bacterial causes of gastroenteritis. We're going to start out with shigellosis. We're going to do, spend a little bit of time comparing shigellosis to salmonella because they're very related, and then talk about some other causes of bacterial infections. Shigella is a gram-negative rod that's able to infect the epithelial cells of the colon. One of the reasons they're able to do that is because they are able to attach to the epithelial cells. So in the top there, you see a shigella bacteria attaching to an epithelial cell and then Shigella then triggers endocytosis. So this is not, um, uh, the, so the way that this bacteria is entering in is by actually triggering that epithelial cell to wrap itself around the bacteria and bring it in. The Shigella is then able to enter into the cytosol, so it breaks out of the um, um, vesicle that brings the, the microbe in, it breaks out of that and replicates in the cytosol of that epithelial cell layer. It then takes over the actin fibers. Who remembers the other microbe that was able to take over actin fibers and move around? Listeria. So similar to Listeria, Shigella takes over the actin fibers, moves around in the cytosol of the cell, 
and then spreads cell to cell, just like listeria. And that's one way that it's able to evade the immune system. It then um, uh, forms a, an abscess um, and as the epithelial cells are killed by the infection because they're replicating. The shigella that enters the blood is quickly phagocytized and destroyed. There is no bacteremia associated with shigella. That's going to be different for salmonella, so I'm pointing that out here. Shigella, the bacteria, gets engulfed by phagocytes, and then the phagocytes destroy the shigella um, and prevent it from disseminating. Bacterial factors, virulence factors for shigella include adhesins that allow them to bind to the epithelial layers. Uh, it also has type 3 secretion system that allows the bacteria to inject its proteins into the target cell. So you can see there's a needle there that connects the two cells. Oh, fun. Um, connects the two cells and allows shigella to inject proteins directly into the host cell. And then it also produces a shiga toxin. This toxin is able to infect the host cell. I'm sorry, this toxin is able to uh, um, destroy the host cell. And it does that by inhibiting protein synthesis. So here you can see this shiga toxin is an AB toxin. The B binds to your receptor on the cell. The A part of this particular um, uh, toxin then destroys protein synthesis in the cell. And that leads to apoptosis or death of that cell. No, I don't want to update my windows. Sorry, hold on. This is going to be different from salmonella. So I'm showing you over here, I'm showing you Shigella once again, just so we can compare and contrast that to salmonella. Again, Shigella gets in, um, replicates in the cytosol, and is destroyed by phagocytes. Salmonella is another gram-negative microbe. This one is flagellated. It attaches to the epithelial cells of the small intestine. So this was in the colon for Shigella. Salmonella is going to be in the small intestine. It then triggers endocytosis. So both of these are endocytose. Um, salmonella, on the other hand, so Shigella broke out of the vesicle and replicated in the cytosol. Salmonella replicates in the vesicle that formed during that endocytosis. Breaks out of the, um, it replicates to a point where it actually breaks out of that uh, vesicle and destroys the cell. This induces fever, cramps, and diarrhea during this infection. Importantly, when salmonella gets into the blood, it is now able to um, uh, disseminate throughout the blood because it is not destroyed by the phagocytes. There are two types of salmonella that are on, um, uh, two, two types of salmonella enterica. Salmonella enterica is one of the leading causes of um, infections, uh, salmonella infections. Uh, this is the leading species. Um, there is salmonella enterica, serovar typhi, and serovar uh, typhimurium. Serovar typhi is the one that's associated with typhoid fever. Typh um, Typhimurium is the one that's associated with food poisoning. This is the one that we most often see here in the United States. Uh, it's found in developing countries. Uh, uh, typhoid fever, on the other hand, caused by serovar, serovar typhi, is most often found in underdeveloped countries. The, I like pointing out this particular table because although they're both caused by the same species, they cause very different symptoms and severity. So for example, in typhi, you have nausea, vomiting, fever, and death. In typhimurium, the one that's caused by um, uh, um, food infections, you get diarrhea, abdominal cramps, vomiting, and nausea. But you don't have that extremely high fever. It's not normally fatal. So this typhimurium is not normally fatal. This is an infection that's uh, found in food, almost always uh, found um, due to contamination of uh, chicken. So for example, um, this is the reason that you should cook your chicken thoroughly to, what is that, 165 degrees, uh, internally because you're trying to kill this particular microbe. On the other hand, Salmonella enterica serovar uh, typhi is found, is, um, 
uh, contaminates water and food. Okay, so we have a lot of comparisons in this particular chapter. One of the things you can do when you're studying is go over this table and make it for yourself. The other thing you can do is fill out this table. Um, this will be in your notes, so you can fill it out, and the answers are on the next slide. You don't have to know this for the exam. I just wanted to mention this. Salmonella enterica caused one of the largest, bio, actually the largest bioterrorism um, activities here in the United States. Uh, and this is due to a cult that wanted to prevent, the same time, wanted to prevent people from voting against uh, their compound, which is just fascinating to me. The largest case of bioterrorism in the United States is over an election. There's a nice podcast. Uh, this podcast uh, from 99% Invisible is a great podcast on that. Okay, so salmonella and typhoid fever. Um, these are the highlights. The um, uh, virulence factors entry. Uh, okay, um, I wanted to point out for signs and symptoms, there's a rash that can appear because this is able to disseminate through the blood. This is salmonella again. It's able to disseminate through the blood, and so you can get this rose, uh, rose spot rash that appears in the lower chest and the abdomen. Gastrointestinal symptoms are similar to other gastrointestinal, um, gastrointestinal diseases. Incubation period is 8 to 48 hours within ingesting food that's contaminated. Susceptibility is travelers to countries lacking adequate sanitation. So one of the things I talked about in the very first slide from the, in the question Q&A was uh, whether or not traveler um, information was important. Uh, this is one of the reasons it's important to find out where people were traveling. And then you can have asymptomatic carriers of uh, salmonella typhi. Think of typhoid Mary. Treatment is fluid and electrolyte replacement. Um, drugs are uh, often given um, against typhoid fever. Carriers may require removal of the glob gallbladder to end carrier status because this microbe is found in the gallbladder. When the microbes are cleared off from the intestine, uh, cleared out from the intestine, they are re established in the gut um, from the gallbladder. Prevention, wash your hands and proper sanitation. Okay. So now we're moving on to E. coli. Again, I like my pub, my ProMed, um, uh, my ProMed searches. This is from the spring, um, just showing that there are a ton of E. coli outbreaks every year all over the world. Here we're just showing U.S. and Canada. Um, the uh, E. coli can infect everything from flour to butter to meats. Um, one of the most well-known cases is OH157 that contaminated meat from a fast food restaurant. E. coli has a number of virulence factors that are associated with it. Um, e. coli in general, we actually have E. coli in our gut and they are non-pathogenic. But if you have a strain that has some of these virulence factors, you can get uh, different diseases. We talked a little bit about this earlier. There are a number of different E. coli that can infect different parts of the body. We're particularly interested in this one, the enterohemorrhagic E. coli, or EHEC, also known as VTEC or STEC. I'm going to call it EHEC. Um, the most common one associated with food outbreaks is E. coli 0157H7. Let's see. Treatment um, from a, an infection with E. coli, this causes diarrhea. Treatment is basically lost, replace lost fluid and electrolytes. Anti-diarrheal um, drugs, so things that would slow down the diarrhea, actually prolong the infection for an E. coli infection. And the reason is that your body has di um, is using diarrhea as a method to wash this bacteria out of the body. And so if you prevent that diarrhea from doing that, then you prolong your symptoms. Antibiotics can induce E. coli to increase shiga-like toxin production. This shiga-like toxin can destroy the epithelial cells. And so generally, antibiotics are not given for E. coli infections. Instead, you replace lost fluid and electrolytes. Um, and this can, this infection can temporarily induce lactose intolerance, which I always find fascinating. I'm not sure why that happens. Okay, so that's E. coli. 
We're going to move on to Vibrio cholera. Vibrio cholera is this comma-like structure, um, uh, comma-like bacteria. So in the top there, you can see it's a gram-negative bacteria that has this comma-like shape to it, and it also has flagella. This flagella allows this uh, microbe to move into, um, uh, move closer to intestinal cells. Once it's at the intestinal cell, it releases this cholera toxin. This is another AB toxin. I talked about the Shigella toxin being an AB toxin. This is another AB toxin. Um, one portion, the B portion, allows this cell, this toxin, to bind to an epithelial cell. And then once in, the A portion destroys or activates um, um, adenylate catalase, uh, cyclase, sorry, uh, adel oh my gosh. <sighs> A1 activates adenylate cyclase, which then increases um, cyclic AMP in the cell. That increase in cyclic AMP stimulates the cell to release uh, chlorine and salt ions. So on the top there, you can see chlorine and salt ions uh, being released from the cell. As, this, as these electrolytes are released, water also escapes from this cell. This water and sodium and um, chloride ions entering into the lumen. This is the lumen. Uh, this is the rest of your body. This is the lumen, the inside of that tube. As this water and these electrolytes enter into the lumen, this creates an incredibly watery diarrhea. This diarrhea is so watery it looks like rice water. So there's a bucket of rice water diarrhea from a patient who has a cholera infection. And in places um, uh, with cholera infection outbreaks, uh, you commonly see these cots that have holes in the middle uh, so that the patient doesn't even have to go to the bathroom because they are so dehydrated, they have no energy to even go to the bathroom, and they're, le they're losing liters of, um, of, or gallons of liquid every day um, through this diarrhea. Treatment is basically rehydration. So this is a patient in the middle of an infection. She's extremely dehydrated. You can see that her skin is really hot. Once she's um, able to get uh, electrolytes and water back into her system, she becomes much healthier and is able to fight off this infection. So rehydration is key to a cholera outbreak. And this is the most um, this is the way that people are treated. They're treated with rehydration therapy. The body will eventually eliminate the uh, bacteria. This is found commonly associated with outbreaks, um, especially after major dis uh, um, disruption of uh, water and sewer, because this is um, most commonly found in regions where uh, sanitation is lacking. We are, there is not we, there is now a, a vaccine that is being used, uh, that is being developed against cholera. This is a really nice article on cholera, both including, it's a nice global look at cholera and how it affects the economy, how it affects um, people recovering from major disasters, etc. The too long didn't read version of that is that there's a cheap, effective, stable vaccine that's been accepted and is used by the World Health Organization. Research and testing is done um, at the International Center of Diarrheal Disease Research. That tells you, I mean, the fact that there's an entire center just for studying diarrhea gives you an indication of how important these uh, diseases are to um, nations. And that's the world's largest diarrheal hospital, and it's um, the testing of the vaccine is supported by the Bill and, Gates, Gil, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Okay, we've talked about many different types of intestinal diseases. Many of these are associated with um, food and water that's contaminated. They're followed by the CDC because if we can identify the source of the infection, we're able to stop that infection from spreading. Um, CDC does a safety report. The last time they updated it was in 2015, but you can see that we've seen a big decrease in the number of E. coli 0157 infections, which is awesome. If you were working in a lab and you needed to be able to identify one type of infection from another, the way that you would do this is through uh, your basic dichotomous key, looking at the shape of the microbe, so straight rods versus curved rods, um, determining what their metabolism is. Can they metabolize lactose or not? Um, are they able to metabolize citrate? Do they survive um, 
do they, um, uh, can they survive on campy blood, campy blood auger? And are the oxidase negative or positive? This is a summary of these different diseases that we've covered. We covered shigellosis, traveler's diarrhea. Uh, we did not cover traveler's diarrhea, I'm sorry. Um, we did cover E. coli. Um, uh, we particularly focused on OH, uh, uh, 0157H7. We did not talk about Campylobacter, so I'm not going to ask you to um, learn about Campylobacter. We did talk about E. coli, but we focused on 0157H7. So, no, you don't have to um, learn everything about Campo's uh, traveler's diarrhea either. We're not covering C. diff, um, but C. diff is, is a fascinating story, so it's, it's covered in your book if you want to read it. We did cover salmonella, um, uh, salmonella outbreaks and cholera. Okay. So a gram-positive microbe that can cause disease, all those ones were gram-negative microbes. A gram-positive uh, microbe that sh you should be very familiar with by now that can cause um, uh, gastroenteritis is Staph aureus. We talked a little bit about the, I, the fact that Staph aureus produces an awful lot of toxins. In the case of food poisoning, it's these toxins that make you sick. So what happens is somebody who has an infection already, perhaps in the nose, and at this point this can be somebody who's colonized and doesn't show any symptoms, so they're a carrier, um, prepares food after touching their nose or, um, um, or a skin infection. The bacteria then are transferred to the food. This bacteria is able to replicate if it's in food that is stored incorrectly. And as it's um, growing on these food sources, it's able to produce toxins. These enterotoxins A or B are ingested with the food. And those toxins that are heat-stable, so even if you heat up the food, you don't destroy the toxin, these heat-stable enterotoxin A's and B's then enter into the body and induce uh, vomiting and diarrhea. So in this particular case, it's not the bacteria replicating that causes the disease or symptoms, it's the toxins produced by the bacteria after it's been growing on your food. The five enterotoxins stimulate intestinal muscle contractions, trigger nausea, and cause intense vomiting. This typically occurs within a very short amount of time of consuming the food. So here I'm showing on the bottom that vomiting occurs within six hours of ingesting the food. This is different from many of the other gastrointestinal diseases where it takes a while for um, the vomiting or diarrhea to appear because it takes time for the bacteria to replicate in the body. Again, this is the toxin causing the uh, symptoms and that toxin uh, causes those symptoms pretty quickly. This is just to show you that um, there are outbreaks of uh, Staph aureus food infections all the time. This is the great one from February of this year in which um, uh, students at a science Olympiad became infected uh, with Staph aureus in their cold pork sandwiches that were served at the science Olympiad um, uh, event, and it was Staph aureus in that pulled pork sandwiches that caused the disease. Okay, treatment is, um, everyone is susceptible because it's the uh, a microbe that's actually part of the normal member of the microbiome. Um, let's see, treatment is self-administered replacement of fluids and electrolytes. So this isn't one, uh, typically this is not treated with antimicrobials because by the time you're showing these symptoms, you've already uh, started eliminating the bacteria from your body by that vomiting of diarrhea. Prevention <coughs> is thorough hand washing before and after handling foods, um, cleaning utensils uh, between foods, and refrigeration of leftovers right away. I should have talked about this before Thanksgiving. Diagnosis for all of these different infections is often used using XPAG GPP. You don't have to memorize this, but realize that this is a PCR or a DNA-based um, uh, method of determining the source of an infection. 
Um, but this relies on knowing an awful lot about the DNA of the microbe causing the infection. The other thing that I'll say is that I asked a friend of mine who um, actually has got four friends who work in um, clinical laboratories, and they said that these machines are really expensive. So in general, um, at least in their hospitals, they still use a lot of culture-based stuff, but the hospitals that have an awful lot of money are able to afford these things and use this DNA-based identification of microbes. Okay. Whew. All right, I have a question for you. Which of these is not a way to differentiate between Salmonella and Shigella infections? Dehydration, presence of a rash, bloody diarrhea, duration of symptoms. Which of these is not a way to differentiate between Salmonella and Shigella infections? In other words, which, is, which of these is similar between Salmonella and Shigella infections? Okay, I hear a lot of good discussion, so let's go over this quickly. Which one, Salmonella or Shigella, which one is able to disseminate through the blood and cause a rash? Shigella is uh, phagocytized and killed by phagocytes. Salmonella is able to disseminate throughout the body and cause a rash. Um, Shigella causes causes bloody diarrhea. Pretty sure it's Shigella. Causes bloody diarrhea. Um, duration of symptoms. I didn't stress this, but when you go through your notes, take a look at that table. There's actually a difference in how long people are infected with these microbes and how long um, they are uh, showing symptoms. Both of these and all diarrheal infections are actually going to cause dehydration. So the correct answer is dehydration. Okay, we're going to move on to hepatitis. Oh, I might actually fit all this in. So hepatitis is an infection of the liver. Itis, again, inflammation, hepha referring to the liver. And the liver is really important for synthesizing blood clotting factors, storing glucose and other nutrients, assisting in digestion of lipids, and removing waste from blood. So when you disrupt the function of the liver by in, um, uh, with an infection or something else, then you have hepatitis. Hepatitis is an inflammation of the liver. So on the left, I'm showing a healthy liver. Yeah, you're left. And on the right, I'm showing a liver with chronic in, uh, hepatitis. You can see it's very inflamed. It's so inflamed that it's um, uh, bulging out there. This chronic hepatitis occurs over time. So typically during a early in a hepatitis infection, the, no the liver looks normal. Um, with chronic hepatitis, eventually, like decades after <coughs> the initial infection, you can get cirrhosis of the liver, and that's a destruction of the liver tissue and extreme inflammation. And then within another decade or so, you can get um, uh, um, hepatitis C, this is particularly referring to hepatitis C, you get hepatitis, um, that this chronic inflammation due to hepatitis C, and this can lead to death. Because you're disrupting function of the liver and the liver takes care of bilirubin, bilirubin can give a yellow tinge to the skin, so when the liver function is disrupted, you get bilirubin circulating in the blood when it should not be, and that leads to a yellow tinge in the uh, skin and in the eye seen here, and that's jaundice. And jaundice can occur in the eye and it can occur in the skin. This is just showing um, that the bilirubin can actually build up in the urine as well. So here we have normal urine. It's actually kind of dirt for urine. Um, and here you have uh, urine with a lot of bilirubin that's um, uh, being secreted in that urine. There are three main types of hepatitis. 
um, that I'm going to focus on, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. They're all, they are all caused by viruses. These are viral infections of the liver. They're all, they're transmitted in different ways though, and they have different outcomes. So for example, here in hepatitis A, um, we have transmission mostly by contaminated food and water or direct contact with an infected person. This causes um, uh, about one in, uh, one and a half million cases per year in the world, so it's not uh, the most prevalent. It's easier to prevent because you can improve hygiene and vaccinate against hepatitis A. There's no specific treatment for hepatitis A. The body clears hepatitis A in most cases. For hepatitis B, this um, hepatitis B is a virus that's spread through contact with blood and bodily fluids. So whereas hepatitis A was uh, mostly fecal aura route, for hepatitis B, this is due to an infection spread through blood and body fluids. Uh, mothers can also transmit um, this virus to their children during um, uh, pregnancy, and it can also be spread through unprotected sex. This is much more prevalent in the world. Two billion cases, uh, two billion new cases are found in the world every year. Chronic infection to lead, can lead to liver cancer or cirrhosis. So again, cirrhosis is that chronic inflammation of the liver, disrupting liver function. And then cancer can also be caused by hepatitis B. Prevention, we do have a, a vaccine against hepatitis B. You can also screen blood. So for example, when you give blood, um, to uh, the Red Blood, uh, the Red Cross, or one of the other blood donation centers, one of the things they ask you is about your unprotected sex history, and it's because of hepatitis B. But we can now screen blood, and you can have protected sex to prevent the spread of this particular microbe. Um, detection is typically uh, PCR, but then there's also some antibody tests as well. And then hepatitis C is almost always spread through unsafe injection. So for example, there's a huge hepatitis C outbreak in California right now in the homeless population and amongst IV drug users. Um, infected blood or organ transfers is another way to get hepatitis C and again, unprotected sex. Two to three percent of the world's population is infected with hepatitis C. And chronic infection of hepatitis C can lead to cancer or cirrhosis. So B and C can lead to um, liver cancer and cirrhosis. A gets cleared from the blood. All of them cause similar symptoms during the acute stage of the infection with fever, fatigue, loss of appetite, um, nausea, abdominal pain, joint pain, and jaundice. Um, it's not possible based on the symptoms to differentiate between these different types of hepatitis. So knowing the patient history is important and doing these diagnostic laboratory um, confirmation is important because of those extremely different outcomes. This is a comparison of the different types of viruses that cause hepatitis. Um, a, B, C, we've covered. Um, the incubation period is different for each of these. So again, in B and C, you can have a much longer incubation period than for A. The severity is uh, different for each of these, with B being um, having um, a higher incidence of um, severity. Uh, there is a chronic carrier state for both B and C, uh, not for A, because it's clear from the body so much faster. Uh, there's, uh, these are the common names. And remember that B and C can lead to hepatic cancer. B and E are interesting because you normally have to be infected. Uh, for D, you um, require simultaneous infection with hepatitis B to replicate. So you cannot be infected with hepatitis B alone. You can be infected with hepatitis B alone, but you cannot be infected with hepatitis B alone. So it's important to test for both B and D if you have a patient who has hepatitis B. This can also lead to cirrhosis of the liver. And then hepatitis E uh, spread through the fecal oral route. It's typically mild. Um, so this is, uh, uh, and there's no carrier case. So this is um, not as severe as the other two hepatitis. We have a large number of hepatitis cases here in Alaska. 
specifically for hepatitis C, and even with vaccination and a new treatment that's just come out, our numbers are still very high for hepatitis C. Hepatitis A and B, we have vaccines again. Students were um, uh, uh, required to be vaccinated before they entered school for A and B starting in 2001. So we've seen a drop off in both A and B. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there and cover the parasitic diseases on Wednesday along with our final lecture.